Uh, thank you to the uh, county, um, for the different county officials and boards that invited me, specifically the health council. Um, and everyone else who came this early in the morning to come and <laughs> have a discussion on marijuana, which is not usually how we're spending probably our 7.30 in the morning, but um, it's nice to be spending it with you. And uh, obviously in this beautiful uh, uh, venue, this beautiful place, I very much appreciate the invitation. So um, maybe you could just, we'll do the advance the slide from there. Just give you a, a quick outline of what I'm gonna talk about, and then I am hoping that we can get into a discussion. Um, I'll talk a, just for a minute, because this is sponsored by, by the Health Council, about the health effects of marijuana just generally, uh, but, but very, very briefly. Get into the discussion of medical marijuana, which is, I think, why most people are here. Talk a little bit about experiences elsewhere, and then relate it to what cities and towns can do. Um, not, not necessarily what they should do. This is obviously a, a local decision that will have to be made. And so I'm going to lay out some of the options at different cities and towns in Massachusetts, um, what they're up to, and then talk a little bit about from a federal perspective, you know, what this means when we look at U.S. law, when we, when we look at places that receive federal funding that are local, uh, because that's very relevant to local residents, um, and then kind of some wider legalization issues. I want to give a, a few disclaimers um, in, the, in the beginning of my talk to sort of get them out of the way um, because, uh, you know, obviously I think it's important to do that. First, clearly I worked in the federal government and it's very clear what, the, what federal law is and what the position uh, of the Obama administration was. We essentially took the stance that although we can't change federal law, only Congress can on marijuana, that, that we have to enforce the law and also talk about, um, you know, the, the negative aspects of marijuana, but that at the same time we were not going to spend resources arresting individual patients with cancer or others. We made that conscious decision um, when, we, when, we, when I was in the administration. I don't speak for the federal government anymore, but um, if you have questions or want to talk about a little bit more in the, on the federal issues related to uh, health care reform, which is something that I, that I spent a lot of time on when I was in the administration, or anything related sort of more federal law and federal government. I will touch on that a little bit, but I'm not going to get into too much detail unless you have specific questions on that. Um, it's, it's well known that I opposed question three when it was uh, up for uh, the ballot in Massachusetts. The, what, what happened was, you know, the way I saw it, you had about $6 million of non-Massachusetts funding, of outside funding, mainly from places like California and Colorado, um, that were trying to influence the vote here in Massachusetts and, and, and talking about this from a compassionate point of view, which which I can understand, although when you sort of look at the way the law is written and what the law of the land is now, it's obviously about more than just people with, with cancer or HIV. And so um, a lot of the treatment providers, people involved in drug prevention um, and law enforcement, we were very concerned with question three. So I'm just going to put that out there that I had opposed question three. I do oppose legalization, although we're not going to really talk about that today. If you're interested in why, I just wrote a book on the subject called Reefer Sanity that you can, that you can find uh, in most places. But I think most importantly, is I realize that question three is now law, and many of you here will be grappling with what to do with it. And that's really what this is about. I am a very practical person at the end of the day, and I realize that this is the law of the land passed by almost two-thirds of Massachusetts voters. The issue of it not being implemented or being repealed is not on the table. What is on the table is how to mitigate the consequences as a result of this, and how to actually deliver, um, really the question is, in my mind, how do we avoid the pitfalls of other states, which there are many. The good news is you don't have to, you don't have to be the first ones doing this. Uh, while securing medications based on marijuana for the seriously ill. Because when you do the polling and you talk to people about why they voted for question three and what the intent was, um, this was about getting medication to those at end stages of life, seriously ill, terminally ill, uh, more than just kind of the typical user that we've seen in California or Colorado, which I'll get to later. So that's sort of the question and, and everything that I'm gonna be framing um, my discussion uh, about. So let's get first into, as I talked about with the, with the health effects, um, you can go to the next slide. I mean, we're mainly concerned when you look at um, marijuana, you know, with the fact that it is definitely, um, you know, not the case that everybody who uses marijuana, or really, this is for any drug, in fact, even tobacco and heroin, et cetera, that everybody who ever uses it will all of a sudden become addicted. That's clearly not um, what, we, what we find. What we do see is about one in 10 or one in 11 adults who start in adulthood 
uh, will show signs of addiction. What happens and what we're a lot of us in prevention are concerned about is more about adolescents and kids because as the adolescent brain is becoming primed and, and forming really who it's going to be for the rest of that person's life, um, it can be greatly influenced by any outside influence. All right? It's why we learn a language when we're four versus 40. It's easier to learn when we're four. Um, it's why we learn to swim when we're young. We're teaching our brain something new. Um, that's the same thing with all psychoactive substances, that when they enter the brain at a young age, they have the potential to affect that brain. They don't affect everybody in the same way, right? We all know, um, you know, the person who smoked tobacco cigarettes for 70 years and died of old age. We also know the person who smoked cigarettes for a year and died of emphysema. Um, so things obviously affect people differently. Marijuana is the same thing. What da the data is found on kids that it's about one in six kids who try when they're around 15 or 16 for the first time will become addicted. Once you start earlier though, 13 or 14, you're looking much more at like one in four. It becomes even more concerning. Um, and, and so that, that, that's, that's the issue with addiction, although, of course, addiction isn't really the only thing we care about when we talk about the effects of psychoactive drugs. Um, uh, really quickly, just a comparison of the addiction sort of chances for an adolescent, someone who starts any drug at that, this age of 15 or 16. Cocaine and tobacco are about equal, slightly more addictive even than heroin. Uh, alcohol and marijuana are about the same in terms of affecting the, the adolescent brain in that way. Next slide. Um, what I think is important to realize is that the, when, when I talk about marijuana right now, I'm talking about the, you know, the flowers that are smoked, um, that the, the marijuana of today really isn't the marijuana that um, maybe my parents smoked or <laughs> other people did in the 60s and 70s. Um, it is very different. We say it's, it's not your Woodstock weed. Um, the psychoactive ingredient has been manipulated through the wonders of science um, to be heightened and elevated. And not only has a psychoactive ingredient, THC, been heightened, the other ingredients in marijuana, and there are hundreds of other ingredients in marijuana, they have been uh, essentially downplayed. Um, a lot of those ingredients are actually, when you look at, for example, you know, monoliths in the Middle East from thousands of years ago, or you look at China and you see re references to cannabis. I mean, the cannabis that was around in China 3,000 years ago, or you know, in the Middle East a few thousand years ago, basically has absolutely no resemblance to the marijuana that kids are smoking in the United States today. And I say that because when you look at that chemical composition of THC, it's so much greater now than it was. In fact, if you go to the next slide, you'll see even just in the last 30 years in red, the THC psychoactive ingredient of average marijuana, this is not all marijuana, but average is about 14 percent um, potency in terms of the THC, which gets you high. And a lot of the non-psychoactive ingredients, they barely register on the, you know, w w when we do the testing. CBD um, is important for you to remember. I'll talk about it later because it has implications for medical purposes of marijuana. CBD is virtually not found in, in street level marijuana that kids are smoking. Now, there are in California, dispensaries and places in Colorado where they artificially manufacture the marijuana to heighten the CBD or reduce the THC for certain strains. So it's definitely out there. But in terms of like the average marijuana that's found on the street, you're looking at 14% THC and really no CBD. How many of you saw the Sanjay Gupta weed special? on CNN, so a couple of people did. Um, so when, when Sanjay Gupta talks about you know, uh, this, this brand of marijuana that's very helpful for, for a little girl that had epileptic seizures, um, what's interesting is that when you, you know, as you watch the documentary and you see, well, what did this little girl actually take to, to make her feel better, um, it does not resemble what's on this chart at all. If anything, it's flipped. But basically, it's the high CBD brands with virtually no THC. So that little girl was not getting high when she was take, taking this liquid of marijuana. It was actually marijuana with CBD in it. So it's, you know, it, it's difficult because our jargon, we just say marijuana for everything. And it, you know, it, it's a very, that's a very, that's not a good label because there are so many different kinds and strains and it dramatically affects, you know, the, on the brain and the body, depending on the composition of the drug. Um, so, so in terms of the brain, we know that for mental health and obviously for physical health too, but for things 
especially related to kids, like memory and learning, reaction time um, is, is affected by, by people that are using marijuana, even after intoxication. So they do studies on pilots who are, um, you know, had been intoxicated, had been given THC, and then two or three days later, look at their flight performance and they still see effects. In fact, some studies see them after a couple of weeks even. Um, but really for kids, what we're talking about is the learning outcomes and things like IQ. Um, the most um, rigorous study to date on marijuana in any population um, is one that they, they do in New Zealand, actually, in the third largest city in New Zealand. They basically have followed people for 40 years. Um, and the, so this is a 40-year study. It's going to go on, go on and on. And what they are finding with the marijuana smokers is that those who are young, persistent smokers, in other words, like three to four times a week from ages 14 to 18, around that time, um, are showing dramatic reductions, significant reductions in IQ related to those who hadn't smoked, even if those people who had used a lot as teens stopped when they were 18 or 19. And that's not very surprising when, when we go back and think about brain chemistry and how the brain does get formed at the adolescent age. Uh, they did not find that IQ reduction with alcohol use, and they did not find that IQ reduction as significant when it was much lower marijuana use at that age and when it had totally uh, stopped after age 18. But for those who had used persistently as, 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 as teenagers, the effect was still there when um, those people were uh, tested at age 38. So um, it, it's pretty significant, and, and we're learning more about it really every year. Next, next slide. Um, so let's go into the medical aspect of marijuana, which is why most people are are here. Um, go ahead. Uh, so you know my position on this, as I said, is pretty well known, but I think sometimes caricatured as being incorrectly. So I want to set the record here: is that I think of marijuana as having medical value. I, I do think marijuana has medical value. My issue is I don't necessarily think we need to smoke it to derive its medical value. Okay? So we do not smoke opium right, to get the effects of morphine or to get the effects of any other opiate-based pills. Um, the opiates, like Oxycontin and others, are obviously deadly. They're, they can be very harmful. They are the leading cause of accidental death today. I mean, it's a, they're obviously a huge issue related to death and mor morbidity and mortality, but they also are very helpful for some people. And that's a lot of the drugs in our pharmacopoeia today, right? I mean, a lot of our drugs are helpful to some people and, and very harmful for others. That's not, that's not the concern with marijuana. Marijuana is, frankly, less harmful than the, than the opiates in terms of, um, in, in terms of the, that, that scale. But, but the issue about the helpful part um, is that we can derive the medical benefits of marijuana um, really without a lot of the risks of, of, of the smoking and without a lot of risks of high THC, especially for those younger populations. That, and so what the Institute of Medicine has said, and really what every major medical association in this country says, including the Mass Medical Society, who by the way also, um, in fact, was one of the reasons why I posed question three was the Mass Medical Society also was pushing for that, um, is that we need to make a distinction between the raw, crude marijuana that you smoke or put in a brownie or whatever, and the components within marijuana that can be delivered in a safer way without the side effects. That, that, that distinction in this very political, politicized, emotional discussion of marijuana policy is sometimes lost. I would say too often lost. And so um, you know, what, what, I, what I'm trying to do, and Patrick Kennedy and others are trying to do, is really talk about this distinction between the individual components, which sometimes work together. I mean, this isn't to say that you only need one component. Maybe you need multiple ones. Um, but, th but those components, either in isolation or together, delivered in a non-smoked way versus giving somebody a joint and saying, this is medicine. Okay, that, that is the distinction, I think, that I would argue needs to be made. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so, we have, science is, is moving on this. In fact, for over 25 years, we've had a pill available at any pharmacy here on the island or anywhere in the country called Dronabinol, and the brand name is Marinol. What is Marinol? Well, Marinol is essentially the active ingredient in marijuana, what gets you high, right, the THC, um, synthesized in a laboratory so that you can, you know, batch to batch consistency, we know that, you know, this pill is gonna be the same as that pill, the same as that pill, so it's done in a laboratory. Um, and delivered by prescription. And this has actually been available for really since 1985, even a little bit earlier on experimental, um, uh, on an experimental basis. And it was, it was uh, manufactured at the time when the AIDS epidemic was hitting this country very hard. And so you had people that were dying of things like wasting syndrome 
or Carposi sarcoma, right? That the, some of the negative effects of HIV, which really, if if you are on the HIV, the AIDS cocktail at this point, um, the Carposi sarcoma and wasting are almost eliminated in this country. Actually, that's been a public health victory that we don't really talk about a lot. Is that people are not dying of AIDS related to Carposi sarcoma and wasting. Um, but at the time they were, we did not have that med those medications. And so, you know, people needed to eat rather than be waste wasting away. Well, what helps you eat? Well, yeah, you guessed it, marijuana. I mean, that's, you know, it gives you the munchies. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it boosts your appetite, which could be very helpful. In fact, scientists are now taking that same molecule, reversing it to treat obesity. That's a very exciting part of science. And it's something that we should encourage. Um, but again, very, very different than telling somebody to just smoke, here's your joint, go ahead and smoke it for medical purposes. And so the THC was made into a capsule. And again, this has been available for a very long time. But what a lot of people are saying is, look, there are hundreds of other chemicals in marijuana or components. Why only focus on what gets you high, the THC? Um, let's focus on the other stuff. And that, that's also, I'm gonna talk, go ahead, a little bit about that. that. That's also being, those are being developed at this time. I, I would argue, and I do argue to my former colleagues in the federal government, we need to improve that research process. It should be easier for people to study marijuana. We shouldn't treat it exceptionally. Uh, we should do the rigorous research that needs to be done. Because I, you know, what's ironic is here I'm talking about some of the dangers of marijuana, yet at the same time, I truly believe that as a medicine, marijuana will prove itself. Um, but not in the way that all of us are thinking about with these you know, different strains like green crack and super silver haze that are being sold in California, um, but actually will prove itself through the pharmaceutical process. And I think that's a good thing. I think, um, you know, frankly, if, you know, I, I've had members of my family die of cancer. Every member of Patrick's family has had cancer. Um, we wouldn't begrudge anybody with, with a disease like cancer to really get anything that they need to help them. That, that's not the issue. I mean, frankly, if heroin helps you, let's figure out a way to get it to you. That, that's not the issue. The issue becomes, do we want to create a separate medical system, right, for this one substance that we wouldn't do for any other substance, as opposed to within the medical system of, of basically you know, going to your pharmacist that you trust with the doctor that you've known for 50, 30 years, who's also monitoring what other substances and drugs that you're taking and can tell you what dose to take, et cetera, and doing that in, in that manner, or do we want to set, set up, which is what we have done in Massachusetts now, a completely separate system for this one substance? I, you know, that's really the, 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 what, what a lot of this, I think, comes down to. But as I said, we need to do research on the components of marijuana. I think that should be encouraged. Um, go ahead. And in fact, um, fast forward to you know, 2013, we are on the brink of actually having another marijuana-based medication available at the pharmacy. Um, except this is very different, much more advanced than Marinol, which is only THC in a pill. This is actually THC and then the chemical I talked about earlier, CBD, which actually doesn't get you high. In fact, when you have THC and CBD in a one-to-one -one ratio, which is what this new drug is, it has in it, it doesn't get you high. Okay? The CBD completely takes that psychoactive effect of, of getting you high away. And that's why, again, if you're trying to grow and sell marijuana on the street, the last thing you want is uh, something that doesn't get you high, right? I mean, that's, that's, right, that's the whole point of, of smoking marijuana is to get high. So why would you have CBD in, in, in raw marijuana on the street? You don't. So, but when you're, when you're kind of trying to come up with a medicine, that's obviously different. And so we have this mouth spray called Sativex, which is approved in 22 countries already throughout Europe. It's approved in Canada as well. It's in late stage approval here. Uh, it's always tougher to get something approved in the United States, but it's in phase three. And I predict maybe in a year or two, I hope, it will be available in pharmacies. And essentially, this is being used for two conditions. People with uncontrollable seizures related, sometimes spasticity related to MS, and folks with extreme neuropathic cancer pain. What's interesting about Sativex is because it has the THC and the CBD in it, it can do those two, it can really work on those two conditions. Because the CBD helps with the seizures and the spasticity, that's like the Sanjay Gupta special. The THC is an analgesic, it helps with the neuropathic pain. And so you put those two things together, you deliver them in this mouth spray, and it's coming forward right now. Next slide, or in the next year. So, you know, what has been the experience, again, looking at this in other states, I think is interesting. Um, th as I said, this has been sold to voters across the country as it really being about this situation, end of life, extreme, you know, terrible terminal pain. 
But in reality, again, we have now over 15 years of experience in various states with medical marijuana. So we can look and see what the result has been. Um, the reality is the typical user actually looks much more like this um, than, than the previous slide. It's, uh, in fact, if you go to the next slide, we know that the average user, for example, in California is a 32-year-old white male, history of drug and alcohol abuse, no history of terminal chronic illness, really reporting, um, usually reporting um, uh, uh, lower back pain. And about 90% had tried marijuana before age 19, and now, now they're going to the dispensary. Now, some people would say, well, it's great that they're going to the dispensary because you know, they don't go to the black market, and it's better, it's regulated. Uh, that's fine, but that's a totally separate discussion about legalization. So we need to really separate legalization and medical here. And we could, you, know, you can argue that we're very happy that a 30-year-old male in California can go to a safe place and buy marijuana, which they clearly did before those dispensaries were in place anyway. We're happy because they don't have to go to the black market. That's a legitimate argument that I may not agree with, but that's a legitimate argument to have, but it's really got to be separated from medical because, you know, in the same sentence, we can't say that this is about people with cancer or, you know, extreme pain and then at the same time say, well, we're actually okay with this guy going to a dispensary. I, I think it really just mixes these two issues up and we have to be very careful. Um, in, in California, it's not exceptional. Um, really across the country, in fact, we're about to publish something that is looking at data in nine states that report the data. We have have found that it's really less than 2% of people in every single state that reports data has combined cancer, HIV, glaucoma, uh, or MS spasticity, or any other severe terminal chronic illness that is, you know, like a rare condition like allodynia or something like that. You group all those together, you get about 4 to 3%, or under 4% nationally. Um, and, and the vast majority are things like um, pain, obviously, anxiety, headaches, um, and these sorts of things. Which, again, okay, if that, you know, as long as we're sort of out in the open about that, as opposed to this being sold the way it is during a political campaign, which is rolling the cancer patients out on a wheelchair and saying this is about them. I mean, th this is why this can get like to be an emotional issue because, you know, medical societies and others who care for those people every day and pharmacists who have spent their career making sure that the drugs that you take are safe and that the Advil you get here on the island is the same Advil you get in, in Worcester um, and there's this consistency are now seeing this whole system kind of be totally upended. I mean, this is where so I think this can sometimes become emotional. Um, go ahead, next slide, I already said that. Um, so let's fast forward now to, again, Question three, law of the land, what does it mean for all of you? What are the issues for towns and city, cities? Well, you know, there are a few different ways uh, in terms of the way cities and towns can govern uh, question three. It usually can be either Board of Selectmen or Board of Health. Um, most cities have chosen the Board of Health, but I'll tell you what seems to work best is really when it's a community-wide process, when everybody is involved, not just the Board of Health, but also the Board of Selectmen, zoning, board, uh, go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so you can't really see that, but basically, yeah, when you have the Board of Selectmen or the City Council, the Board of Health, the Zoning Board, really all need to be involved in decision making. Um, really, each board's decision will affect the other, so it's, there's a lot of interplay. It can't be done in isolation. So an example of that is, right, zoning laws, right, they're written and determined by the Zoning Board, um, but a Board of Selectmen may have a strong influence on what that zoning is. Um, uh, through internal discussions or they could take an official position. Um, you know, again, another example, a Board of Selectmen opinion may influence how a Board of Health will deal with the enforcement of something like, let's say, home grow regulations. So, right, so this Board of Selectmen can say, well, you can have like one plant that's up to this tall, whatever, and then the Board of Health can say, you know, all right, well, if you're gonna have the one plant that's, you know, this tall, then we're gonna make sure that there are these health regulations that go along with it um, as well. So there's really the interplay. The question is, you know, can cities and towns ban dispensaries altogether? Now, th there's not really an answer to this yet. There is an answer according to the Massachusetts Attorney General, and that answer is no, that the law of the land is question three. You cannot opt out because that goes against the law of the land. Uh, but according to the town of Wakefield, Mass, and other towns that actually are coming on board in Amicus Curie, we are seeing that they are challenging that um, because essentially they're, you know, the, the centerpiece of the, that challenge is this unique power in the mass uh, of mass municipalities under the state constitution that says that the towns and cities really legislate these issues for themselves. So this is actually an open question right now in terms of can there be an outright ban? Um, 
and this is being played out in the town of Wakefield versus Coakley as we speak. The California Supreme Court, you know, 15 years later, came to a decision uh, after the first cities started banning. Because in California, really, what happened was, um, I don't have slides on this, but it's an interesting background. When they passed medical marijuana in 1996, there were no dispensaries attached to it. It was simply like an affirmative defense. If you had marijuana on you, you could say, look, I, have, I suffer from a chronic condition, so I'm protected. Um, about seven, it took about seven years for people to realize, you know, we should do what a yeah, there are a few people in San Francisco did, and we should open dispensaries. Why aren't we doing that? It's a moneymaker, we should do this. They started spreading all over the state. If any of you were in California in around 2007 or eight, you noticed, for example, in Los Angeles, there were more dispensaries than Starbucks coffees, um, which, you know, and, and I'm from Southern California. We like our coffee, so it's not that we didn't have enough Starbucks. Um, and, and it was really becoming, I mean, there were like 1,100 in Los Angeles alone. I mean, there were four per corner in some neighborhoods, by the way, usually in the poorest, poorer neighborhoods. And um, people rebelled. I mean, people said, look, we voted for this because if my grandma, God forbid, has cancer, I want her to get marijuana, but I didn't vote for four dispensaries on my way to, you know, taking my kid to school with the barbed wire and cash only neon signs and the bouncers hanging out in front of these compassion centers. That, that is not what we voted for. So there was this really rebellion. And they all of a sudden, you know, Los Angeles went from 1200 to about 50 to 100. So they cut it by over 90%. And then you had in a lot of areas, cities and towns ban these all together. They said, you know what, attracting people we don't want to have come to our city, not the quality of life that we want to have in our city. Against federal law, we don't like it, we are banning. This was challenged by advocates and eventually went to the California Supreme Court where they said cities and towns can ban them. Massachusetts, this is being challenged now. We don't know where this will end up. Um, if you go to the next slide, obviously there are some less extreme measures that a city or town can do than, than do what the what town of Wakefield has done, where you can use zoning laws to be sure that these are not near schools or parks or any other place. Um, we, the data that's been out there on dispensaries have basically found that having dispensaries along with home cultivation, this is what a recent RAND report just came out with saying, is that it does, it, it, in those states that have dispensaries and home cultivation, there is greater use even when you control for prior use levels. Um, so that's, that's an issue for youth and for people that are concerned with youth. Um, towns can now establish temporary moratoria if they would like to. That's legal, the Attorney General said that is legal, um, to impose time limitations while they develop regulations for these dispensaries. Now there are some towns out there that are kind of, you know, sort of, they're, they're not banning them all together because they don't want to do what Wakefield does, but like the city of Arlington, for example, um, near where I live, is basically saying, um, you know, we have three or four people that are applying for a dispensary. We may or may not grant the, any applications depending on what our zoning laws are, depending on what our electorate feels like, and depending on what our leadership feels like. So, you know, we, we're not going to ban, but right now we may just not approve them. We may wait to approve them. And, you know, that is frustrating clearly for people that are applying for dispensaries, um, but had, that has not been challenged um, in court. So that, that seems to be another way if, if towns want to delay that they are allowed to delay. So. Again, zoning laws, many communities have imposed zoning moratoria saying basically there can be no center until, you know, um, let's say in, where was it yesterday? Norway, I can't remember what city it was, but it was another city was saying nothing until June 2014, uh, which is gonna give us time to come up with the regulations and bylaws that we need to come up with. So that's also another option that's been used. Um, let, let's bring this back to the kind of the federal perspective. Um, so marijuana is still illegal under federal law, right? Controlled Substances Act. So that means that every medical marijuana transaction that you undertake when you sell, buy, grow is a federal felony. Um, now, what does that mean for practical purposes? Well, again, the Department of Justice has said they will not prioritize uh, going after individuals or their caregivers who have a debilitating disease, uh, cancer, et cetera. Um, but really this rests largely on the U.S. attorney's discretion. So, you know, what was so interesting is when I came into the Obama administration in 2008, 2009, a lot of folks were saying, you know, wonderful, this means, you know, the president's been really loose on this issue, lax, this is gonna mean that we're gonna be allowed to have dispensaries, and this is wonderful. And um, the attorney general was really pressed on that. He said, well, what are you gonna do, uh, Eric Holder? Because a candidate Obama said he's gonna leave this issue alone. And the attorney general released this statement basically saying we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna prioritize 
as it says up here. And that gave the false impression really to medical marijuana activists and others and dispensary owners that this was gonna be you know, a free for all. And so in a place like Montana, which had zero dispensaries, all of a sudden they had like 500. In a place like Colorado, which also had zero, all of a sudden they had like 700. So you know, it, it precipitated this huge rise. And the US attorneys in those states who enforced federal law said, well, wait a minute. I mean, this is totally violating federal law. We're not gonna go after you know, the 85 year old over here with cancer, but we can't leave the $10 million you know, revenue dispensary that is causing public safety problems. We can't leave that alone. And frankly, if cities or states enable that, they are liable for prosecution, which was actually a very, I don't say extreme measure, but it was um, even surprising to some of us that the, the department would say that it could go after state employees. In fact, the state of Washington, um, under Governor Chris Gregoire, who was in favor of medical marijuana, had to veto a bill to allow dispensaries because she said, I'm not gonna put my state employees and my city employees here at risk for federal arrests. Now, nobody was arrested federally. It was a threat that, that was not carried out in those cases, but this is a legal gray area. I mean, we don't know who's gonna be the attorney general you know, tomorrow, let alone in three years. Uh, we don't know what the position the federal government's going to be. So that, that is a disclaimer. That is something that the town needs to have a conversation at. Now, a lot of places are going to throw the dice and say, look, um, you know, you're going to come after me and my two employees who are, you know, selling this much marijuana to two people. Good, you know, good luck with that. Um, and they probably aren't going to go after that. But again, you should know what the implications are federally. Now, the federal government has traditionally not gone after users with simple possession. So the idea that the feds are now gonna you know, enforce against somebody who has a card who is growing, for example, in their home, one or two plants, is probably much more far-fetched than going after dispensaries because, again, the feds really have never focused on low-level um, folks with, with a small amount of marijuana. And frankly, when I talk to state and local law enforcement, they tell me they don't focus on those with very low level um, uh, amounts of marijuana. Um, but again, there's the law, there's the way the law is applied, and, and you kind of have to fill in the, the middle. Um, I'll touch a little bit on legalization issues, but I actually think we should have a conversation. Why don't you keep going? Yeah, you can, you can keep going, keep going. Um, so obviously, I think there are things we want to avoid, <laughs> probably. You know, again, Colorado and California have gone through this. The good news is you don't have to do it. Um, you know, that's, the, that's a billboard still on Hollywood Boulevard on the right with, with Doc 420, and that is the actual doctor. Um, and you know, then you have you know, the vending machines on the left, which, you know, those, a lot of people in this field worked in anti-tobacco, right, for like 30 years trying to expose what big tobacco had done in terms of selling tobacco to kids and saying that actually we're not and it's really not that harmful and doesn't really cause cancer and causing a lot of doubts. You know, the irony here is we spent, you know, decades against the tobacco industry getting rid of things like tobacco vending machines. And yet, the medical marijuana vending machine business has now grown to be a $6 million business. Um, it just started, $6 million. So, you know, there are just, I think you should know that there are some interesting things happening around the country um, which maybe run counter to some of the public health principles that I think many of us hold very dearly. Ne next slide. Um, we have seen things being marketed to kids, and I would avoid this as well if you can help it. Um, you know, I. Last time I checked, the you know person with a couple of months to live dying of cancer probably you know ring pots that say legalize that are medical uh, marijuana probably wouldn't be appealing to that person. It would instead be appealing to you know ten year old kid. Um, we've seen things like pop tarts turn into pot tarts. We've seen the the sodas and all that. This isn't to be alarmist. This isn't to be you know showing you the extreme. This is not extreme. This is typical in a couple of the states that have medical marijuana. And I, and I felt like it was important that you at least see this to see what's going on and maybe try and avoid that for, really for the future. Uh, next slide. Um, you can go ahead. I already talked about the use rates. Go ahead. Um, you can move, move forward. Yeah, we, we already did that. Uh, you can go ahead. Oh, this is about Colorado. So I'm going to summarize this quickly. But basically, in Colorado, since they've so Colorado, again, like California, they passed their medical marijuana, and for eight years, they had no dispensaries. So it just wasn't an issue. Dispensaries were not an issue. It was home cultivation. That was it. Then after this memorandum that I talked about earlier came out in 2009 by the Obama administration, that was when the green light went off for a lot of people. And they decided to go from zero to you know, some several hundred, I think it was 700 or something, uh, or five, maybe 500 dispensaries in, in Colorado. And um, 
really from that time, not from when the law passed, but from the time that they had the dispensaries, 2009, when they, again, it wasn't three or four dispensaries, it was hundreds in a small area, that's when they had the issues of greater use rates. You can go forward um, to positive screenings among high school seniors. Uh, a recent study of uh, 164 kids in treatment, three quarters of them said they got their marijuana from a medical dispensary or that you know, it originated from a medical dispensary, even if they didn't walk into one, it was their friend or their brother or their parent. Um, you know, that, that, that's probably gonna be an issue if there are a lot of them and if it's out of control. Um, again, from 2006 to 2012, yeah, the cardholders went from 1,000 to over 108,000. So it went from, you know, a program like Vermont or May, I mean, those are tiny programs. Rhode Island, they have a couple hundred, a couple thousand people then it goes to going very big, and that was the number, 532 from zero uh, in a six-year period. So, you know, they've done audit after audit, and they've shown in Colorado that this has not regulated at all. The city has no idea what it's doing. I mean, I, the city of Denver, you know, God bless them, they're trying their best, but they're not in the business of dealing with this kind of issue. Um, they've never done it before. The state of Colorado was audited at the exact same time that the city of Denver was, and the state of Colorado was found that there was absolutely no way that they could track who had cards. It, they found that it was 10 doctors that were recommending to over 80% of the recommenders. And by the way, that, that is going to be the case here and everywhere. That's what we've seen everywhere is that it's not in the medical profession especially if you're at a hospital that gets federal funding and you're at a hospital like Partners that has an official policy on this, um, is not you know, really excited to dive into this and to start recommending marijuana. It's not really something that they want to get involved in. You will find a, it'll be just usually a very small amount of doctors. And in, even in California when this happened, there were doctors, most doctors didn't want to get involved. So you had a lot of people come in from other states that were setting up shop to get involved. And in Hawaii, you had the same thing. You had people Skyping in to Hawaii um, to give recommendations. And then there are, there are cases like that. So you will likely have the out of state uh, issue as well. In fact, if you look at a lot of the people in this state who applied for medical marijuana dispensaries who are not from the local area, a lot of them are from places like Colorado and California. Or you Google medical marijuana and you see where the um, consulting advice is coming from. It's coming from Colorado and California because that's where, you know, that's where they've done it um, and, and that's where, you know, that's where their experience is. So anyway, next slide. You can keep going. So I talked about the increases in use among teens. Um, 74%, go ahead. Uh, they, you know, the traffic fatalities has been an issue. You can't really see this in yellow, but what's interesting is that they had a, a major reduction in traffic car crashes between 2007 and 2011, which is when this big medical marijuana boom came. Uh, but when you dig a little bit deeper into, well, what about just crashes with drivers that had marijuana in their system, um, you know, it had, it had risen from about 20 to 60. Um, and at the time that it had reduced for all crashes. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean the marijuana caused a crash? Well, we don't know. We just know that the marijuana was in the system. What it does mean is there are more people using marijuana, which I guess shouldn't be that much of a surprise in a place that, that allows this. But again, these are indicators that you all should know, especially teens are reporting that marijuana is safe to drive uh, under the influence of, which it is absolutely not safe at all. Um, you know, <coughs> driving 20 in a 65 and not knowing where the stop sign is, is just as dangerous as driving 100 in a 65. Um, it's just dangerous in different ways. Um, and so the, the reaction time is, is a huge issue. And the British Medical Journal just came out with the most comprehensive study on drugged driving and actually found that um, marijuana intoxication doubles your risk of a car crash, which is really what we're seeing in the data. Um, so what are our choices for smart policy? You know, I mean, we, and I haven't talked about Project SAM at all, what we're doing kind of on, on marijuana generally, but, you know, Patrick and I both think that we should not have this false dichotomy of either you go to jail or we should legalize this and let it go out to market forces like we have with alcohol. We think both of those things are actually not in keeping with public health principles, and you can do something much closer to the middle. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, go ahead, next slide. Uh, go ahead, that just talks about Project SAM. You know, just again, a little bit of what, what we're doing with SAM. First is just to get the information out to the public like this on the science of today's marijuana. We find that most people do not know that marijuana is much more harmful now. They think that because them and their friends smoked a little pot and they're all fine, that everybody else is fine. 
Um, obviously, you can't just transfer your own experience and generalize it, but, but that's been happening. We do want to have an honest conversation about incarceration and arrest and making sure that if you're caught with a joint when you're 17, that you're not, you know, destined never to get a job because of that criminal record. That, that's an issue we also care about. We're really concerned, as you can probably tell, with the establishment of this idea of big marijuana. And I didn't dwell on that here, but, you know, again, fighting big tobacco for decades in this country we seem to be ushering in this movement of big marijuana, which is not really what we're talking about here with small dispensaries, but it is what we're talking about on the next step, which um, you should also know, I didn't include this in the slides, but it, it, I would be remiss not to say it, is that the same folks that, that said that this is only about those with cancer and compassion in 2012 who, who put the money behind the campaign, those same folks have already announced that in 2016 they're coming for, for full legalization. Um, so again, I, I, this just goes back to the idea that we do need to separate these issues and they're often not separated. And the issue with full legalization that a lot of us are concerned about is this emergence of a big industry that's going to hook kids and start them early. And finally, as, as you could tell from the last um, thing, is this idea of promoting research into marijuana's medical properties. So as much as I'm afraid of big t you know, marijuana, as much as I'm afraid of the drug driving and kids using, I'm also saying we need to be out there pushing research and development of medications that have not been traditionally looked at. And that's fine. And that's good. And, and we need to look at things like complementary medicine. We need to look, look at things like non-Western medicine. That's wonderful. But we should at least do it within some scientific parameters so that, again, um, you know, we know that you know, the, 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 the uh, drug that you get at the pharmacy here is the same drug that you're getting at the pharmacy out in Maine or in Oregon, that, that there's this consistency and that you actually know what you're getting. I think that is, that's a big concern. So finally, um, what can you do? Where, do we, where can we lead the conversation? Where would I suggest maybe some of your topics you at least look at? Um, we in Project SAM are looking at the creation of model laws and regulations for places that do have marijuana as medicine because at the end of the day, 63% of citizens voted for this. They voted for essentially allowing the seriously ill to access marijuana. Okay, so the question is, how can we do it in the safest way possible? So is there a need for smoked marijuana if you have dispensaries? Well, what about the idea of a dispensary selling a non-smoked tincture like Charlotte had in the Sanjay Gupta special? Um, that doesn't get you high, okay? What about the idea of having, for those that do have the cancer pain and do need the THC, THC delivered not in a pill form, but also not in a cigarette form, but it, or in an edible form, but in another way, um, like a liquid or an oil, in another way that could be beneficial for those people truly you know, with those debilitating conditions. That would be an interesting thing, I think, for all of you to look at. Um, and like I said, what about CBD-only marijuana? That doesn't get you high, that it's not something that kids want to get their hands on because it doesn't get you high. Uh, what, about, what about looking at that? So I think maybe you can have those conversations going forward. I tried to provide a bit of a, a, bit of a comprehensive um, overview of some of the issues, and I really look forward to uh, engaging in discussion. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, please. Now, but, uh, sure. We have one Do you mind if I sit? Long, okay, long sure. Long please. Um, if you lived in Washington, what would you do today? What would you suggest we do related to that? Well, I think that goes to this last slide that I, that I talked about, which is you know, looking at the experiences of other states. Um, I do think, and I, you know, the, in terms of allowing some time to figure out um, what those laws and regulations should be is important. Rather than being rushed into this, you do not, you know, the Attorney General has said that you do not have to be rushed into this. You can take time. So I think taking some time. Um, and what, what I would do if you had to implement question three, if I had a magic wand, I would have maybe one place, um, well, depending on, you know, the, the issues of transportation, but a, 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 a few places at most that would have the, you know, non-smoked versions of marijuana in a tincture or an oil, and I would make sure that you know the, the people that are getting it are not the typical folks that you've seen in California and Colorado, but are the folks that are suffering the debilitating diseases where nothing else has worked for them. Their own doctor, not the, because you're going to have doctors coming in from California, if you haven't already, by the way, because it's a gorgeous area, from California and Colorado coming in, these rented doctors at 200 bucks a pop, who are going to be very happy to you know, go over any of the doctors that are actually known on the island and be the pot doc collecting 200 bucks cash only for each recommendation. 
Um, I, I think that's an issue that you should that you probably want to look at. And I think again, the way to do that is to have places that actually say, okay, if your own doctor that you have a bona fide relationship with has said nothing else works, look, you know, we're not concerned about you becoming addicted to marijuana. You maybe have a year to live. We'd like you to live in comfort. Nothing else has worked. Here's a marijuana tincture or an oil or etc. I think that would be much more sensible than what they have done in California or Colorado. Um, do you have any suggestions of possible measures of, of success for how? Mm, that's a that's a great question. Yeah, it's re actually that's a great question. It's really important to have benchmarks and to have outcomes and and to be following this on the data. Now, there's not usually money lying around to do data research. That's unfortunately the last place people want to put money. But I do think it's important to um, first you know, do, uh, uh, um, test the attitudes. And I know you have some local data sets that do, do some of this. But test the attitudes of young people um, so that over time, as this is being implemented, to see if young people are a, more easily accessing uh, marijuana like they are in Colorado, B, what their actual use levels are, you know, see what their attitudes are on this issue. I think that, that that would be a benchmark of success. If you, in you know, in three or four years, if you don't have the increase you've seen in other places, if you don't have the diversion, if you don't have the mixture with organized crime, which you do have in places like California and Colorado, um, and if you, you know, if you don't have those things, then and and the actual profile of the user who's using this is somebody with a debilitating condition. I think that that would be a, definitely a good benchmark for success. Um, doesn't federal law preclude treating marijuana as just another medical drug like the law did? Is there an equity question? So. Well, you clarify the question? Yeah, please. Sure. <laughs> the anonymity is so, over. <laughs> I was delighted to see the, how you presented the need to separate medical marijuana right. as a medical drug with a valuable therapeutic profile yeah. from marijuana as a recreational right. drug. And that legalization, right. that there are, these are both are valid, interesting social right. decisions for right. us to make as a society, but right. they should be right. separated. My first instinct coming in with great ignorance about the entire question was to say, it's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Sell it out of the hospital pharmacy. Right. It is by prescription only. It, there are very clear medical guidelines that doctors follow in putting out these right. prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, Immediately, I was informed that our hospital cannot yeah. uh, take marijuana right. into its pharmacy and right. sell it along with any other That's drug right. that a person would be prescribed for legitimate That's right. medical needs. Right. So, so why? Is so, it, is it well, because of federal right. law. Right. Exactly. Right. Because you can't prescribe marijuana. So if you ever so hear anybody say is, prescribe, yeah. it doesn't. It can't happen. It, it, it doesn't happen because you're right. It's a. It's a con such a one controlled substance, and there. You know, and the reason why the AMA or other. You know, the mass medical society or others have agreed with that is that because you know the idea that you can dose marijuana like that like you do with like smoke marijuana is extremely difficult if not impossible um, and that we don't smoke any other medicine I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's marijuana or not so those are only two of several reasons why every time advocates put forward marijuana to be rescheduled um, in, so that it can become a product that you could prescribe, those petitions get rejected. Because when you look at the science and you look at how you'd actually do it, um, the raw marijuana with its hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of components in it is going to be very difficult to actually turn into a prescribable medication. But what isn't difficult to turn into a prescribable medication is Marinol, which is already available at a pharmacy, uh, but also Sativex, the spray. But there can be numerous, I mean, that's not the only one. There are numerous others that are currently being developed that eventually will be there. Now, the question inevitably that gets back to me when I say that is, well, that's great, Kevin, but you know what? Um, I have a debilitating condition. I'm not trying to smoke it for fun and I don't have three years to wait for the guy to do it at the pharmacy. So what would you suggest for me? And what I suggest and what we're trying to push in the government is essentially to have an experimental program where a lot of these drugs that have not yet been FDA approved are given to people with these very, you know, that, 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 that pass these certain conditions. Um, like I just described, and then that way there's, you know, there's no, you don't have to go around um, what's happening. But that, that isn't the reality yet, unfortunately, but that is something that we're trying to, to push for. Um, but raw marijuana as a prescribable product, just, it's not going to happen. So it, there's just no, the idea that you're going to have a pharmacist with, you know, joints in a, in a bottle, it's just, it's not going to happen. 
No, thank you. <laughs> and then you can ask them. If they want to do it. Yes. Question. Sure. How common is the prescribing of marijuana? Mm, that's a great question. It's actually not common at all anymore. Um, that's it, what's, what's really interesting about all this is that there's a couple reasons why it's not. First of all, we have much more superior drugs for uh, cancer uh, pain, uh, neuropathic pain, and uh, so the, that, that's for that. And then for the AIDS wasting, AIDS wasting is not an issue anymore. So the idea of needing THC for an appetite uh, uh, stimulant isn't, isn't actually an issue. It, it's somewhat common. There, I don't even think it's profitable for the company that makes it. I mean, that's what's interesting. Um, and so. In fact, you know what, and what can be frustrating for someone like me trying to separate this, because I agree, we need to separate it. The reality is it's not separated. It's in the political sphere and it's totally mashed up. Um, and, and that gets very frustrating. And, and, and it's also frustrating to be able to say, look, we want to have Sativex, the mouth spray. We want to have a, a suite of these marijuana-based medications available for people. Yet when those things even happen, you still have the folks that aren't separating the issue that are saying, no, 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 that's actually not, uh, you know what, th that's not good enough. We want to be able to just have the raw marijuana that I can grow at home. I don't want to go to a pharmacy. I don't trust the FDA. The healthcare is expensive. I want my own thing and I want to grow marijuana just like you know people did thousands of years ago. And, and that's where the stalemate starts, because then it's like, okay, well, are we going to then just allow that for any medicine? Because why are we giving marijuana a pass if we're going to go around the pharmacy-based uh, system, if we're going to go around the FDA uh, standard practices for safety and efficacy? So, so, so it opens things up to, to much, much more. At the end of the day, if I haven't said this already, I should say it again, I have no qualms with somebody getting anything helping them, making them to feel better. The issue is, though, of public policy. When you're in a county health council, when you work at a federally funded hospital, when you are a selectman, that, those issues then become very, very sticky. And it's not, as, not just so easy as to say, well, if you have cancer, I'm OK with you doing it. It comes with a lot of other issues that need to be ironed out first. Can towns insist on data collection? Sure, towns can do whatever they want as long as they have the money for it. I don't think the state, now I think that you could argue to the state and to DPH, look, you're implementing these, 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 um, these programs and you're telling us, Attorney General, that we can't ban them. We'd like you to help, <laughs> you help cover the costs of actually looking at the data here. So I think that would be very legitimate to ask. Well, can you tax it then? Can you? So that's a good question. Um, so I, in some states, they have very small taxes. Um, now, in a state like Colorado, they didn't know where the tax money went. It didn't cover even the price of regulation. So because now all of a sudden you're telling also law enforcement, well, you know, we, we want you to go after the people that are doing it illegally outside of this regulatory sphere. Um, but we're going to create this regulatory sphere, uh, which then it's going to cause all these problems. You know, good luck. I hope you have extra money and extra guys to go after that. Yeah, that puts law enforcement in a very difficult position. The money that is collected on taxes does not cover the, the, the cost. So yeah, you could, you could possibly tax it. Those tax proceedings are all subject to seizure by the federal government. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? They may, you may be able to keep them. But again, it, it's rolling the dice on that. I have a number of questions about the potency of marijuana. You sure. gave information about potency of mar yeah. marijuana thousands of years ago, and right. uh, even more recent studies mm -hmm. has is there potential that there's been some loss of potency related to the time. Well, there, there's only been an increase in potency. In fact, the 14 percent, which is the average. Go ahead. Sorry, did I not understand no, the no, question? The question is, how do we know compared to? thousands of years ago oh. or even 30 years ago, how do we know? Okay, that's true. I mean, thousands of years ago, none of us were alive and we didn't have the scientific instruments from, the, you know, from what historians can tell us and what we've seen in terms of what the effects were and in terms of how you know, different populations used it. Uh, first of all, it was not widespread use. So that's the other thing. I, you, you really have to separate this from a drug like alcohol, right? Alcohol has a history of 7,000 years, the vast majority of Western civilization. Um, marijuana has a history of thousands of years, but it's the vast minority of any civilization other than maybe some isolated um, you know, native cultures, et cetera. So you know, it's very different to compare the cultural history of cannabis versus alcohol. 
Um, in terms of how do we know 30, 40 years ago, well, we did have instruments to test THC. And so you know, we've been doing that for 30 or 40 years. Um, and they've been pretty reliable, really, over multiple countries. It's not just the United States that does it. It's, it's other countries as well. I'll tell you, the 14%, though, is average. And that means that that's also taking the ditch weed that grow, you know, stuff that is not used by a lot of kids in, in, in areas. So I, I would say 14% is often actually low. I mean, really the, the THC we're finding in, and I don't know what it is right in here, but the THC in most places now are you know, getting upwards of 20%. Easily, you could get up to 30, 35%. And I'll tell you, with mar one thing I didn't talk about, where it's, uh, was uh, anybody has anybody heard of dabbing, the marijuana oil combustion? Yeah, some people have. Um, it's a huge issue for youth. This is 85% usually THC, which means it's a waxy oil substance. I mean, you can't even. And so you, you put butane to light it up, and you inhale the combustion of the smoke. That has sent thousands of people to the emergency room. Um, it's a huge issue because if you're especially an inexperienced marijuana user and you're now taking 85% THC, I mean, good luck. It, it's really, 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 really harmful. So forget about 15% THC. We're seeing 85% THC in, in, with that. Big issue. Um, there is a question related and, and probably just asking to expand on what you just said. What have studies been done on the strength and or the properties of medical marijuana mm. in California and Colorado. Yeah. Yeah, you can look at, I mean, there are websites that have the menus, and you can actually see the, and then, the, you know, a lot of dispensaries like, you know, like in Napa Valley and just like wine, there's a huge variation from, you know, 0%, or not 0%, but um, no, 1 or 2% to, you know, 30, 35% THC, depending on what it is. Again, the issue is, you know, that's what it says, but no, no state health board or FDA can look at that. I mean, the, the, you know, again, this is fitting a square peg in a round hole. So that, that's what it says. You think that's what you're getting, and hopefully it is what you're getting. Um, but there's really no way to actually know what's in the dispensaries other than you kind of take their word for it. And it's 1 to 35% usually what we're saying. A number of questions about the prescription slash recommendation mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Um, what are we going to get then? Again, you can't prescribe it, so it's recommended, usually doctors note. Massachusetts law before dispensaries allows you to have an authorization basically written on paper. That's about it. I mean, there are no other real, there are no other real requirements, but it's, the reason why 99% of doctors want nothing to do with it is because it's not a prescription. It's not, the, you can't prescribe a Schedule One substance. So. It, they have to be comfortable with this separate system of writing it on a note on a separate notepad. You know that I authorize this person to get marijuana. By the way, Massachusetts state law uh, and it was brilliant the way it was written. I got to hand it to the advocates. It lists all the conditions in the beginning that tug on the heartstrings that I think any of us would want to would authorize. I mean, you know, cancer, ALS, HIV. I mean, it's a horrible thing. And then the last thing, if you end up you know reading the last line, is you know, or any condition that, is, that has been authorized. <laughs> so really, it's for any condition. Um, we know that. As long as you have a physician and, I believe, caregiver now authorizing this on a piece of paper. That's it. A piece of paper from a physician. So they don't have to be registered, licensed? Right now, they don't. Not before the, the rules have been promulgated by the Department of Health. Because the way the initiative was written, it was like, well, if you don't get your act together in a couple of months, this is coming into play. Um, has, so. has there been enforcement against doctors? Not yet. Oh, in, around the country? Um, yeah. Yes, medical boards uh, have, I mean, it's, you know, it's a touchy issue, but some medical boards have gone after the doctor that is you know, responsible for 80% of the recommendations where it's clearly you know, for, not for just medical purposes. And there has been that. The feds tried to go after doctors. In fact, the Clinton administration had a uh, case that went to the Supreme Court where they said, um, you know, this is out of normal prescription practices, doctors. You cannot even recommend it to your patients. And that was the only lawsuit the feds have lost on this entire issue. And they lost it because of the First Amendment. You can't regulate that speech between a physician and a patient. So, so you know, a physician can, is open to say what they want to a patient um, about anything related to marijuana or not. Can you discuss, distinguish between California, Colorado, and states like 
Island, yeah, Vermont. yeah, it's it, that's a good that's a good uh, idea. Is to the, the, you, you shouldn't paint medical marijuana with a very broad brush. I showed you Colorado, which is on one extreme. The other extreme would be a, would be a state like right now, like New Mexico or um, Hawaii or um, in some respects Rhode Island and Maine, although they do have a few dispensaries. But you know. I bring up Colorado because the way the Massachusetts law is written in terms of how many dispensaries can be there, you know, there has to be a minimum of I think it was 16 or so dispensaries there or more, I can't remember. Um, but there is a minimum number, whereas like Maine, Rhode Island, these places, it was just the legislature put them in place and they have them like between one and three and they can keep it very small. And so in a place like that, you had very, very small numbers uh, in their registry. Whereas in Colorado, because there are hundreds of dispensaries or in California or other places, there are a lot more um, problems related to the fact that you have this dense, dense, dense area of dispensaries. And so, yeah, we should make a difference, a distinction between those, those two kind of separations. Can, I, can I just embellish on that? Sure, please. What, what I was trying to ask is, oh. can, you, can you just communicate like how Massachusetts and Rhode Island, are, the state is closely regulating those these yeah. programs versus out there. That is true. In California, that, that's a good point. In California, they've kind of taken the, you know, the way it was written, it was so open and loose. There was no, the state had nothing to do with it. It was like, you can grow your own and yeah, well, if you want dispensaries, maybe we'll interpret that you can have it. It's very, and that kind of opened up, yeah, to a lot of these problems. Um, Colorado, the same thing. Now, I will say though, in Colorado, they did try and regulate it. Maybe it was too late. Maybe the fact that they didn't regulate it from the beginning was the problem. And so Massachusetts will be doing that. Maybe that's better. We'll see. But Colorado tried to say, okay, no, 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 we don't want that. We're going to get involved. And you had like the auditing and you know, the audits that just came out that basically said the government had no idea what it was doing. Um, you know, it does not track anything. We don't even know where the money is. I mean, it was a real, real problem there. So that was heavily regulated. I think in Massachusetts, yeah, they are trying to do this. So it's not like a California situation. Um, I would say it's almost a hybrid of I wouldn't say it's exactly like Rhode Island because this is much smaller with only a few, you know, going to be state stores. It's taking years to start up. Massachusetts is running on a very small time frame because it was a voter initiative which mandated certain dates that you cannot get around. So, you know, it's much, much faster. I would say it's sort of a hybrid between a Rhode Island and a Colorado. The question is, and this is where you guys get to frame this, is it going to go more towards the, I would say, not good model of Colorado or towards the better model of Rhode Island that's really in your hands? I hope it goes towards the better model. It was my state. I want it to go towards a better, better model, but I, I don't know. Time will tell. Thanks. Um, Follow-up question on the, uh, you said the, the, the regulation was written physician or caregiver. Can you, who qualified? What's a yeah, I, I don't have the language right in front of me, but I believe it's anyone. Well, the, the, care, the person who qualifies as a caregiver is anyone that you designate. Is that, that's anybody. You don't have to have a certification for a caregiver. If I'm at home and my mother is my caregiver, my mother is my caregiver. I mean, that, that, there's no like specific certification that you need. I don't have the law right in front of me. Uh, in, do you have it in front of you <laughs> in terms of what what exactly that says? Um, so maybe we can look at it and come back to so it. So then that what what. So the caregiver then says, to the caregiver could be a recommender, and if you had this piece of paper from a caregiver, it's the, it's the yeah. Then you can the caregiver or yourself can grow the marijuana yourself. Oh, okay, but yep. Okay. Um, do you think it would be wise to hire someone or designate someone to be supervising this program? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you have like a place like, you mean like, lo, in the, was this for local level or state level, lo, local level? I mean, yeah, maybe. Uh, you had that in Maine. There were a lot of problems. Uh, unfortunately, he, you know, they like got rid of them and then they had to find somebody else and it, they, it, that took some time. But um, yeah, I mean, to have somebody to kind of oversee the process. Uh, but I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't leave it, though, for, with only one person. I would have, you know, this group, this community-wide group with city, selectmen, zoning, health council working together. So as long as that one person was able to coordinate with all those groups, yes, I wouldn't leave it in the hands of those, just one person. If you could help it, it needs to be community-wide. So in the, in the law, this is yeah, a, a registration of personal caregivers. To obtain a registration card as a personal caregiver, the qualifying patient shall submit in the form of a manner determined by the department the following the caregiver's full name, date of birth, address, telephone number, email address, and a statement that the individual is 21 years of age. 
full name, date of birth, and address of the qualifying patient, <laughs> copy of the of personal caregiver's driver's license, government-issued ID card, or other verifiable identity document acceptable by the department, a statement of whether the caregiver will be cultivating marijuana for the patient and at what address, and if the patient is grant, granted a hardship cultivation registration, a written acknowledgement by the personal caregiver of the limitations on his or her authorization to cultivate, possess, and dispense to his or her registered qualifying patient marijuana for the medical purposes in the Commonwealth, an attestation by the personal caregiver that he or she, there's only one more, <laughs> that he or she will not engage in the diversion of marijuana, that he or she understands that protections conferred by the act for possession of marijuana for medical use are applicable only within Massachusetts, and lastly, any other information required by the department. You have to say that to Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. There was a question back there, too, I think. Do you have a question? Or? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, this was uh, this, this just a hot question. Can you, can you get a recommendation from a doctor or a caregiver in another state? I think you touched on that with the Skyping and things. What about Massachusetts? Uh, yeah, that's actually a really good question. I, do you know the answer to that? No, Is I DPH? Ask that I think no, they have to figure it out. Because of tourism. Yeah. So do you know? A little curious question oh. to me. Yeah. I, I think DPH. Does, does, it, does it actually say that in the law, or does DPH have to say it? Okay. All right. You know, I, I think about that with people coming here yeah. for vacations, whether that will be part of it. Yeah, the vacation thing is a big issue taxes. in like Hawaii and California and stuff. Yeah, I, I don't remember that aspect of the law, but if you're saying it is, then it's good. Uh, what percentage of the population are registered patients? And so I guess. Oh, in other states? Yeah, I mean, it obviously it depends. I don't know that you can take the percentage of 108,000. Um, the thing is, like in a state like California, there are a lot of people who are not registered because they don't really have the, a registry that's official that are doing it, that, that just have this as an affirmative defense. So you can't always even just look at those that are registered because a lot of the folks, they have an affirmative defense when they're pulled over by a policeman and says, well, why do you have marijuana in your car? Well. I, here's my note from the medical, you know, from my caregiver. I'm not registered because I haven't had time or I don't, I just haven't wanted to register, but I do have the note. And that, that's kind of a gray area about, again, that, and that's again where this puts law enforcement in this position of, well, I, you know, how do we deal with, with situations like that? So I don't know what the percentages are. I do know that we have the numbers, but they're an undercount because they don't, they don't constitute everybody. Do you, do you know what the status in, in Massachusetts is in terms of the register, keeping track of? Registered. The Department of Public Health is going to be having a registry live online and it's going to have all that information soon. They don't have it yet. Right. They, will, they will be in charge of it. Folks who are authorized would then be registered. And that would be They're travel. supposed to be. Okay. Um, in places where there are dispensaries, are there any statistics on the THC levels of the street marijuana? There aren't statistics on that. Uh, again, that's more to look at what, what's been done. And like I said earlier, we're, we're talking anywhere from the very low THC, high CBD brands, like what was shown on Sanjay Gupta, to the much more common 20 so percent THC. And you talked about it with the hyper concentrated already. Yeah, uh, that's before the. Before this question, what are the effects of 70? Well, yeah, I mean, this is where things like, I mean, it, a lot of times what people don't get is, and that's because there are a lot of people who smoke marijuana who don't have a problem with it, there are still 400,000 emergency room admissions every year, I didn't talk about this, related to marijuana. A, a lot of times, first time users, naive users who, who take too much, a lot of times, you know, things like panic attacks, it's the acute, really it's the acute anxiety attacks and panic attacks that are the results of the, of the emergency room admissions. And with things like dabbing, you know, that is, that is just um, punctuate it even more, um, especially if you're not a exper very experienced marijuana user. In fact, what, what dabbing is used for is really by people who've been smoking for 30 years who don't get high anymore. I mean, their brain has changed so much that, that or they're so tolerant of the THC that they don't, you know, 30% THC doesn't do it for them anymore. Then they go to this inhaling butane through combustion with, with, the, with the dabbing, which probably isn't very good for you. The last question that I have, I say it for last, okay. since it's like, why isn't there a more rational system at the federal level? And are there some interim steps to, to help people <coughs> other than what we're doing? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I talk, this is kind of more of a 30,000 foot thing, and I talk about this a lot in, the, in my book, is that you have, you know, this period of the 60s and 70s where marijuana represented, you know, the counterculture, and then you had the reaction to that, which was the, the mainstream conservative elements of society saying, this is, you know, don't like what you're about, including marijuana, we're going to react this way. And so you've had kind of these extremes, and I think now we are living the consequences of, of that kind of confrontation, and those consequences are, it's very hard to have a rational discussion about marijuana without, you know, getting very emotional, without, you know, bringing in a lot of other issues. And I think on the federal level, uh, because the folks bringing medical marijuana have always been the advocates wanting full legalization, it's always been seen with, um, with, with distrust because it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, 10 years ago, you were here talking about why legalization is good. Now, all of a sudden, you care about people with cancer and HIV. Well, what's going on? And so there's been that distress. And I actually think that has fed into a lot of the fact that we haven't had the research going as much as we should on the what science has shown can be, very, can be interesting. I didn't give my history talk on the history of uh, psychoactive substances. But if you look at opium in early 1900s, you had opium and cannabis in about the same place why did opium go this way with rapid development of opiates in terms of pain and also an awareness of their non-medical use? So there was that huge separation, right, between opiates and the non-medical use. I mean, obviously that today gets muddled with the prescription drug issue. But by and large, I mean, people understand that you can have, not everybody that's having, you know, Oxycontin is doing it for harmful purposes. You had cannabis did not go that route at all. Well, basically, the, the scientists were not that interested. In, and so I don't just blame the government, also scientists scientists were not interested in, in cannabis as a medication to develop other than what had been in the pharmacopoeia before, which it used to be in the US pharmacopoeia. And they basically said, this isn't the way to go. It's really going to be the opiates. And the result of that, and then on top of that with cannabis, all the other government stuff, and pro and con and blah, 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 you had really a, a stunting of the development of cannabis as a medication. So now, fast forward 100 years, we're living in a situation where there are some people that genuinely get relief. This is not about a legalization. You know, agenda for them. There are people that genuinely get, get relief from marijuana. They say, wait a minute, why is the government pre preventing me from getting this? This is helping me with no nothing else does. This is helping my daughter that has the epileptic seizures and Sanjay Gupta features, which nothing else does. W you know, this must be some part of some big government, you know, conspiracy and there's some big issue here. And in reality, it's simply we have not explored that avenue the way we should have. And so what we're trying to say now with Project SAM especially is let's explore that avenue in a rational way. Let's get medication so that a pharmacist can dispense it, not somebody who is, does not have a medical background. And let's just do it the, the proper way. And um, unfortunately, that hasn't won out. What has won out are political campaigns with millions of dollars that bring out the cancer patient in the wheelchair and say, this is what this is about. You should vote yes. And as a result, we're left with a mess. We're left with a, a square peg in a round hole. Cities and towns trying to figure out how to, how to make sense of all of this, well-meaning folks um, who, who have compassion for others, people who care also about youth and youth use. And so that's where we're at today. And so we're trying to kind of clean it up a little bit um, by going a more rational route. In the meantime, we have to deal with this the best we can. So. Sure, thank you, everybody.